issues related to coastal agriculture. My name is Madeline Cavalieri, and I'm a Coastal Program Manager at the Coastal Commission. We really appreciate you taking time out of your day today to learn more about some new documents that Commission staff have been working on. Uh, these documents are currently in draft form, and we're looking for comments from you, the public, government agencies, and other organizations and stakeholders. Um, we have everybody in listen mode right now. If you have um, questions or comments or um, any technical issues, you can go ahead and, and type those into the chat box, and we'll be monitoring those. So um, we have four draft documents that have been posted to our website. And if you go to our home page, um, you can click on Agriculture. Under Learn, you'll get to our new Agriculture page. And if you scroll down a bit, you'll see links to the documents. We're accepting comments until close of business on Friday, June 23rd. And you can email comments to us, as well as any questions um, to our email address, which is at the top of the screen there, agriculture at coastal.ca.gov. You'll also see on this page, uh, web page down a bit that we have a link to the video recording of a workshop that we held in Humboldt on sea level rise adaptation for Humboldt Bay's agricultural land. And that workshop included several informative presentations on the history and value of agriculture in Humboldt Bay, sea level rise vulnerability affecting Humboldt Bay's agricultural lands, and potential adaptation strategies to address those vulnerabilities. And the information and discussion may be applicable to other agricultural areas that are vulnerable to sea level rise in the coastal zone. And the video should be posted soon, so I'd encourage you um, to take a look. So to start today, I wanted to give a brief introduction about agriculture in California's coastal zone. Although the coastal zone is relatively narrow, it contains a variety of landscape, soil, and climate characteristics that provide for a great range of agricultural resources that are very important to our state's economy. Coastal California has moderate weather conditions, fertile river valleys and coastal terraces, and a long growing season that extends at least from March through October in most coastal counties, and in some counties is year round. Agriculture in the coastal zone includes a range of activities and products, including livestock and dairy operations, vegetable row crops, fruit and nut orchards, cut flowers and field crops, including vegetables, beans, hay, and grain, like oats, barley, and rye. Coastal agriculture also produces a number of high-value specialty crops and products, such as artichokes, Brussels sprouts, celery and salad greens, strawberries and raspberries, wine grapes, avocados, and lemons animal products, including wool, cheese, and honey, and nursery plants, bulbs, and Christmas trees. The steeper and more rugged portions of the coastal zone often lack water and prime soils, but they still provide valuable grazing and rangelands used for livestock and dairy operations, some of which include a value-added component like the many cheese-making operations in Marin. Large greenhouse operations are also used in some coastal counties like Santa Barbara and Ventura County, where specialty nursery products like orchids, poinsettias, and ornamental landscape plants are grown. The Coastal Act protects agricultural land for agricultural uses by encouraging the use of these lands for production of food and fiber and limiting the conversion of agricultural land to other uses. So to further protection of agriculture, the Commission received a federal grant to address permit processes and emerging agricultural issues. Next, I wanted to just give a brief introduction of the documents we have been working on, and then I'm going to turn it over to Daniel Nathan, who is one of our coastal program analysts, and Lori Cotin, one of our staff ecologists, who will walk through the documents in more detail. And following their presentations, we hope to have some time available for questions, um, but we are limited to an hour today. So the first document we have is on permit processing and procedures for agricultural development. I want to stress that this document does not create any new rules or regulations. It is meant only to clarify and explain the existing rules. Commission staff has two main goals for the document. The first is to provide additional clarity on permitting requirements, and the second is to describe streamlining methods for agricultural permits that can be used both by the local government and by the commission. We hope that this document will help create efficiencies for any required permitting and also help protect our valuable coastal resources. The second document we have is on supplemental uses on agricultural land. Supplemental uses can include agricultural processing facilities and on-site sales, as well as agricultural tourism facilities, 
that in breakfasts and special events like weddings. But reviewing supplemental uses on agricultural land can be complicated, and we hope that this document will assist local governments and property owners in understanding how these uses relate to coast flag policies that protect agriculture. The third document is on public access. It's a brief handout describing measures that can be taken to ensure that public access is compatible with agricultural uses. And finally, we've put together a fact sheet on carbon sequestration through soil amendments on active rangelands in California. Soil amendments are getting more attention as a way to sequester carbon, especially through some pilot projects in Marin County. And we wanted to raise awareness for this practice and encourage local governments and other stakeholders to explore opportunities to use it in the coastal zone, including potentially as a way to mitigate unavoidable impacts to coastal resources. So after we complete the presentations on this document, we hope to have some time for questions. We have um, over 100 people registered today, so we're going to start by taking questions and comments through the chat box. You can send a chat anytime throughout the webinar by clicking on the red arrow on the top right corner of the screen. And we'll start by answering questions we get there. And then if there's additional time, we may be able to open it up um, for discussion. And also, you can feel free to send us an email anytime at the, our, our um, email address, agriculture at coastal.ca.gov. So now I'm going to turn it over to Daniel Nathan, who will talk about um, permit process. Thank you, Madeline. Uh, as was just mentioned, I will give a presentation on two documents developed as part of a broader federal grant project on agriculture. You can find these documents posted on our website under the agriculture web, web page, which is shown here on the bottom of the slide. The first document I will cover is the core document developed under the grant project called the, the Informational Guide for the Permitting of Agricultural Development. This document covers the most common permitting and planning procedures under the Coastal Act that farmers, landowners, and local governments may encounter in the coastal zone and identifies ways in which agricultural development may be streamlined or even exempt from the regulatory process under the Coastal Act. However, this document is intended to be used as an informational resource and not as a regulatory document or legal standard of review for the actions that the Commission or local governments may take under the Coastal Act. And so, this document should be read in conjunction with any applicable legal standard of review, such as the Coastal Act, and not in place of it. That said, we hope that this document will aid farmers, landowners, and local governments undertaking agricultural development in the coastal zone, and that the document will help them navigate the Commission's regulatory process. The informational guide is divided into five sections. The first section provides an introduction to the document, including a brief discussion of coastal agriculture in California and how the Coastal Act's broad mandate to protect California's coastal resources encompasses agriculture. This section also includes a brief discussion of how the document is organized. In section two, the informational guide provides an overview of Coastal Act policies related to agricultural protection. Section three then provides a flowchart of permitting requirements for agricultural activities in the coastal zone. The flowchart acts as a step-by-step -step permitting guide, prompting the reader to refer to specific descriptions of permitting requirements that are covered in detail in section four of the guide. And finally, in section five, some of the expedited permitting options discussed in, in Section 4 are elaborated on in terms of local government implementation, as well as some additional permitting options for local governments and special districts that were not covered in Section 4. Before I get into the flowchart in Sections 4 and 5 in more detail, I will briefly review the relevant Coastal Act policies related to agriculture that are covered in Section 2 of the Informational Guide. Under the Coastal Act, agriculture is both a coastal resource and a priority land use that is protected by a number of policies. The Coastal Act's core agricultural policies require that the maximum amount of prime agricultural land be protected in agricultural prote production so that an area's agricultural economy is safeguarded. This is implemented in four different ways. First, by establishing stable boundaries between urban and rural areas to minimize conflicts between agricultural and urban land uses. Second, by limiting conversions of agricultural land. Third, by developing lands not suitable for agriculture prior to the conversion of suitable agricultural lands. And fourth, by assuring that all divisions of prime agricultural lands do not diminish the productivity of prime agricultural land. The Coastal Act also calls for protecting the long-term productivity of agricultural soils and for promoting continued agricultural operations in existing areas while protecting other coastal resources, such as public access, scenic views, 
and water quality from the impacts associated with agricultural development. The Coastal Act also directs new development to be located in existing developed areas and restricts land divisions such that agricultural viability does not become compromised. When development is proposed on agricultural land, these policies must be considered by the Commission or a local government with a certified local coastal program in issuing a coastal development permit. For those on this call that might not know what a coastal development permit or a local coastal program is, coastal development permits, or CDPs, are permits for a development in the coastal zone that ensure compliance with the Coastal Act or the relevant local government local coastal program. Local coastal programs, or LCPs, are certified coastal plans that carry out the provisions of the Coastal Act by specifying the location, type, and scale of new or changed land uses. Each LCP contains a land use plan, which includes the general policies for coastal resource protection, and an implementation plan, which includes the specific measures to implement the policies under the land use plan, much like zoning ordinances. When local governments have certified LCPs, they take over permitting authority and issue CDPs in their respective jurisdictions. However, in some areas, such as in tidelands, submerged lands, and public trust lands, the Commission always retains permitting jurisdiction. Even if a local government has a certified LCP, a coastal development permit from the Commission may be required, again, depending on the location of the development. To find out whether a particular development activity follow, falls under a local government or the Commission's jurisdiction, interested parties should contact their local government planning and building division or the local Coastal D Commission District Office, which are listed on our website under Contact. In Section 3 of the Informational Guide, you will find a flowchart that illustrates some of the most common permit and exemption processes that are available when an agricultural activity is proposed in the coastal zone. The flowchart is meant to be used as a visual prompt that guides the reader to the correct regulatory procedure for their proposed agricultural activity. The flowchart is meant to be read from top to bottom, starting with the top left box in orange. Along the left-hand side of the flowchart are boxes in red that refer to a subsection under Section 4 of the Informational Guide. The red boxes prompt the reader to refer to a particular subsection for more detailed information on the permitting exemption or permitting requirement. Because the Coastal Act stipulates the types of development that do and do not require a permit, the requirements for obtaining a permitting exemption or a more streamlined permitting option are the same throughout the coastal zone. However, because some local jurisdictions elect to include some, but not all, procedural mechanisms in their certified LCPs, the process for implementing these permitting requirements may vary, or in some instances, may not be available at all. Returning to the flowchart in Section 3 of the guide, if we look more closely, the reader will come across the first and most important question that must be asked for any proposed agricultural activity, whether the proposed agricultural activity meets the definition of development under the Coastal Act. The reader is asked to turn to Section 4.1 of the Informational Guide to review the definition of development under the Coastal Act. Here the reader will be able to review the Coastal Act's definition of development, including an explanation of how development is defined broadly include not only typical land development activities, such as the construction of agricultural structures like barns and greenhouses, but also changes in the intensity of land or water use, such as expanded irrigation systems. Section 4.1 also discusses the exception to the definition of development through the removal of major vegetation for agricultural purposes, and describes when the removal of major vegetation is considered development, such as instances of removing sensitive vegetation to expand agricultural operations, when it is not considered development, such as when existing crops are removed. Lastly, Section 4.1 provides a summary of the most common agricultural activities that meet the definition of development, as well as some of the activities that are not considered development. Having referred to Section 4.1, the reader should return to the flowchart and answer the prompt from the first box. If the answer is yes, and the proposed agricultural activity meets the exception of the definition of development, the reader would not require a coastal de development permit. However, if the answer is no, the reader is asked to follow the arrow to the next box on the flowchart. At this prompt, the reader is asked whether the proposed agricultural activity has been lawfully existing since prior to the effective date of the Coastal Act and its predecessor statute, the Coastal Zone Conservation Act of 1972. Here the reader is asked to refer to Section 4.2 for a description of what qualifies as a vested right, including the relevant dates and agricultural operations must have been in operation to be considered pre-Coastal Act, 
and how the location of the agricultural operation in light of these two dates impacts its determination. This section also discusses how a key requirement in determining whether an agricultural operation possesses a vested right is whether the activity occurred in a legally de developed footprint with some examples of the types of agricultural development that may not require a CDP, such as ongoing use of fields for crops and grazing. Once the reader has reviewed this section and determined whether there is a vested right for the subject development, the reader should return to the flowchart and answer the prompt. The next box on the flowchart asks the reader whether the proposed agricultural activity is exempt from CDP requirements under the Coastal Act. In this prompt, the reader is asked to refer to Section 4.3 of the Informational Guide to review the permit exemption that may apply. In this section, five categories of development are discussed that are potentially applicable to agricultural development. The first exemption relates to improvements to structures other than single-family residences or public work facilities and describes how this exemption does not apply to improvements to structures that are located in or adjacent to areas with certain sensitive coastal resources, such as wetlands and streams, and other predetermined locations on the coast, such as between the sea and the first public road. The second exemption covered in this section is for repair and maintenance acti activities, which generally refer to those actions that are necessary to preserve a development in its permitted configuration and condition for its an anticipated life. This subsection goes on to discuss how repair and maintenance activities must avoid any expansion or enlargement of existing structures and how adverse environmental impacts must be avoided even if no structure, structures are being added or enlarged. Section 4.3 then goes on to briefly discuss utility hookups with the third category listed under the section, categorical exclusions, discussed in further detail in the subsequent sub section, section 4.4 of the informational guide. Utility hookups refer to the installation, testing, placement and service, or replacement of any necessary utility connection between an existing service facility and any approved development. This means that if your proposed agricultural development is approved with a utility connection in mind, such as an electrical or water connection, an additional permit for the utility extension from the existing utility service point may not be required. Finally, Section 4.3 discusses replacements after natural disasters as another potential permit exemption under the Coastal Act. This subsection discusses the criteria that must be met to qualify under this provision, including the legal status of the structure before it was destroyed, its adherence to existing zoning requirements, and the requirement to, re to be replaced in kind, amongst others. Once this section has been reviewed, as with previous sections, the reader should return to the flowchart and answer the prompt. In the next box, the reader is asked whether the agricultural development activity is excluded from permit requirements pursuant to a categorical exclusion order. Here the reader is asked to refer to section 4.4 of the informational guide which discusses how categorical exclusions allow for certain commission-authorized categories of development to be excluded from CDP requirements, provided that the category of development has no potential for any significant adverse effects on coastal resources or public access. This section of the informational guide goes on to discuss how categorical exclusions apply to specific geographical locations and may vary from one location to another. The section also describes what types of agriculture have typically been excluded from permitting under categorical exclusions, such as barns, wells, and storage tanks, and how interested parties should confer with their local governments on whether a categorical exclusion for their proposed development is applicable. At this point, the reader should return to the flowchart and answer the prompt. If the reader has reached the next prompt that asks whether a CDP is required by the commission or the local government, the reader will notice that here, the flowchart splits into two, asking the reader whether the development qualifies for expedited permitting process under the commission or the relevant local government. Section 4.5 of the informational guide follows this division with two subsections that discuss some of the expedited permitting options that may be available. Section 4.5.1 covers those instances where a coastal development permit is required from the commission because the development activity falls under an area of commission retained jurisdiction or because the local government does not have a certified LCP. This subsection goes on to describe a permit waiver that the Commission may issue for certain types of development that generally require, a, require CDPs but are determined to not have significant impacts on coastal resources, and de minimis waivers which can be issued for any category of development if the development in question has no potential for individual or cumulative adverse effects on coastal resources and is consistent with Chapter 3 of the Coastal Act. 
Both types of permit waivers are discussed further in terms of how they have been applied to agricultural activities in the past, including for the diversion of water supplies for livestock, for example, how waivers are processed through the Commission, and the benefits of the waiver process, namely that they result in lower permitting fees and significantly, significantly faster processing time. Section 4.5.1 then goes on to discuss Commission-issued administrative permits, which are staff-level CDPs that are reported at Commission hearings and are issued for certain types of development. In this section, the benefits of administrative permits are discussed, as well as the key differences between administrative permits and regular CDPs. Finally, Section 4.5.1 discusses how a development that does not qualify for a waiver or an administrative permit will require a standard Commission-issued CDP and how such CDPs are reviewed and processed by the Commission. If we return to the flowchart and follow the second box, which asks if a CDP is required by a local government with a certified LCP, the reader will be asked to refer to Section 4.5.2 in the informational guide for description of the streamlined permitting processes that may be available under the relevant local government, including permit waivers, local hearing waivers, and administrative permits. Section 4.5.2 describes how these permit processes may differ or may or may not be available from one local government to the next. This is because each certified LCP determines what local CDB processing procedures are included in their jurisdiction and how each specific permitting process shall be implemented. Similar to the previous subsection, Section 4.5.2 also discusses the issuance of standard local government issued coastal development permits. Finally, in the last section of the informational guide, Section 5.0, a discussion of available opportunities for streamlining the local government permitting process is provided. This section is written with local governments and special districts as the target audience in mind, as it includes detailed information on the regulatory requirements for implementing some of the expedited permit processes identified in Section 4 of the guide, as well as a few additional opportunities beyond standard permit permitting processes that were not identified in Section 4. Section 5 is divided into six subsections, with each subsection covering a particular opportunity for streamlining the permit process. The first two subsections cover local government issued permit waivers and hearing waivers, which were covered in Section 4.5.2, but are elaborated on in Section 5.1 and 5.2 with regards to a local government's authority to issue such waivers, the standard of review in issuing these waivers, and certain noticing and hearing requirements that local governments must follow. The third opportunity for streamlining, for streamlining categorical exclusion orders is discussed in Section 5.3, but here the focus is on how a local government can go about preparing and submitting a categorical exclusion order, as well as how to implement the categorical exclusion if and once it has been approved by the Commission. The last three subsections of Section 5 cover additional opportunities for permit streamlining that are available in some cases to local governments, special districts, or federal agencies that in many, agent, many instances work with local governments and special districts. These three subsections include public works plans, federal consistency determinations, and consolidated permit processes. Section 5.4 on public works plans discusses how specific public works functions, such as storage and transmission of water, sewer, and other utilities, can be approved as a sort of master permit that allows ensuing individual projects to proceed if they have been allowed under the public works plan and are in compliance with the design, construction, and implementation criteria approved in the Public Works Plan. This section may be of particular interest to resource conservation districts and other special districts which can apply for Public Works Plan. Another opportunity for streamlining the permit process is the Federal Consistency Determination Process, which is discussed in Section 5.5 and essentially authorizes the Commission to review federally, federal activities in addition to individual projects. This authorizes certain types of development in compliance with pre-approved design, construction, and implementation standards similar to a public works plan and may be implemented on a system-wide scale on a reoccurring basis and over multiple properties. In the past, the Commission has issued general consistency determinations for numerous restoration projects initiated by the USDA's Natural Resource Conservation Service, which allowed the NRCS to work with farmers and landowners to implement conservation projects and best management practices to reduce runoff and sedimentation into waterways. In some instances, these general consistency determinations included other regulatory authorizations, which freed farmers and landowners from having to obtain separate permits when implementing the approved development activities. 
Lastly, Section 5.6 briefly covers the co consolidated permit process, which allows for development projects that require two coastal development permits, one from the local government and one from the Commission, to be acted on together. For more information on these opportunities, please refer to Section 5 of the Informational Guide. This concludes my presentation on the Informational Guide. I will now turn to the Supplemental Uses document and provide a brief overview of the content of this document and its intended use. The second document examines supplemental uses on agricultural land. Supplemental uses are generally taken to mean any land use on agricultural properties other than the growing and harvesting of the agricultural products themselves, which are intended to supplement or support the long-term agricultural viability of the site. This is not a new issue. Landowners have long been interested in the types of allowed land uses on agricultural properties in order to sustain viable agricultural operations. However, more recently, the issue of supplemental uses on agricultural land has been raised more frequently, often in complex or new ways. Thus, this document is intended to address this emerging issue by providing additional information and examples to help interpret and address this topic. Supplemental uses may include agricultural packaging and distribution facilities, on-site agricultural sales and consumption activities, farm worker housing, and agricultural tourism facilities. Supplemental uses also include other non-agricultural uses, such as wedding events and other special events, bed and breakfast, and solar and telecommunication facilities. But because determining whether a particular land use is allowable is dependent on a multitude of parameters, including the location of the development, presence of prime soils, the impacts to coastal resources, and the relevant LCP policies, to name but a few, this document is not intended to be an authoritative guide for decision making, but rather a resource in helping landowners, local governments, and other stakeholders understand the types of issues that are considered when land uses other than the growing and harvesting of agricultural products are proposed on agricultural land. The supplemental uses document introduces and examines the concept of agricultural and non-agricultural supplemental uses through a brief introduction, background, and purpose, including a short section on the Coastal Act policies that are relevant to how supplemental uses on agricultural lands are addressed. The body of the document examines past commission actions that address supplemental uses on agricultural land and is split into two sections one section on local coastal programs and the other on coastal development permits. In each section, examples of the Commission's past actions on LCPs and CDPs are provided to highlight how the Commission has generally treated the supplemental use of agricultural lands in the context of the Coastal Act. The Coastal Act does not define the term supplemental use. However, the Coastal Act addresses land uses on agricultural lands by requiring land uses to maintain prime agricultural land and agricultural production, by limiting conversions of agricultural lands to non-agricultural uses, and by instituting various provisions to maintain and enhance agricultural productivity. In this light, every supplemental use of an agricultural property must be evaluated individually to determine its potential to diminish an area's agricultural productivity. When examining these potential impacts, a number of parameters are explored, including how the introduction of the supplemental use might result in the encroachment of urban development, whether the viability of the existing agricultural use may be threatened from the introduction of a supplemental use, and whether the supplemental use will effectively convert the agricultural land to non-agricultural land. In many instances, economic feasibility studies are required for these determinations as they provide information on how a supplemental use might affect the economic viability of the agricultural operations under question. Two primary observations can be made here regarding the application of these policies to supplemental uses, as demonstrated by the examples provided in this document. One, in general, agricultural-related supplemental uses have been allowed on coastal agricultural lands when such uses have been proven to be necessary for maintaining agricultural viability and when they have been proven not to result in the loss of agricultural productivity or adverse impacts to other coastal resources. Two, while agriculturally related supplemental uses may be supported on agricultural land under these circumstances, non-agricultural supplemental uses on agricultural land, such as overnight accommodation, are generally not approved on agricultural land except under very limited circumstances. 
In the section on supplemental uses in LCPs, the document opens by discussing how several LCPs call for examining the footprint of the proposed supplemental use in relation to the amount of land available for agriculture. As an example, Marin County's LCP is highlighted, which requires all structural development to be clustered together and limited to 5% of the gross acreage of the property under question. This policy is highlighted here and in the document to show one critical mechanism that LCPs often use to address supplemental uses on agricultural land. The document also highlights how LCPs from various jurisdictions treat agricultural and non-agricultural supplemental uses differently. For example, in Humboldt County, stockyards and animal waste processing facilities are conditional uses, while general agricultural activities such as field crops, dairying, and tree farming are principal permitted uses. Similarly, in Marin County, non-agricultural uses and development, such as for-profit educational tours, hunting and fishing facilities, campgrounds, and bed and breakfasts with a particular number of rooms are allowed as conditional uses with findings that the long-term agricultural pro productivity of the property will be maintained and enhanced as a result of the non-agricultural supplemental use. And in Santa Cruz County, any use of agricultural land is allowed in the commercial agricultural zoning district if findings can be made to show that the use will enhance or support the continued commercial agricultural operation and will not reduce, restrict, or adversely affect agricultural resources or the economic viability of the commercial agricultural operation. Santa Cruz's LCP also requires that the supplemental use be shown to be ancillary, incidental, or accessory to the principal agricultural use of the site and that no other agricultural use is feasible. The document also discusses dwellings on agriculturally zoned land under, under the section on LCPs, which highlights how LCPs treat the development of housing uses to ensure that such uses are in support of agriculture. For example, many of the LCPs require that farm dwellings be allowed or conditional uses, but not principally permitted uses. Some only allow agricultural dwellings for agricultural landowners, while others may place size limits and, and placement restrictions or restrict the number of dwellings allowed. As an example, Ventura County's LCP allows one farm worker dwelling unit as a principally permitted use on lots meeting the minimum size for the county's coastal agriculture zone. For lots that do not meet the minimum size requirements or for additional farm worker dwelling units, the LCP requires a conditional use permit. This section of the document then goes on to discuss how some LCPs allow for single family dwelling units to be established on agricultural land if they are considered agricultural uses of the property and how in some LCPs, dwelling structures must be clustered together to avoid future land divisions on agricultural land. For coastal development permits, the document highlights how the Commission has upheld the Coastal Act when addressing both agricultural and non-agricultural supplemental uses through CDPs. As an example, the document discusses a CDP that was approved on appeal to the Commission for a vineyard and distillery project in Marin County. As approved, Supplemental uses of the site fostered agricultural use of the property by supporting development of a small vineyard and diverse agricultural land uses, as well as enhancing existing agricultural operations and viability. The document then discusses how the Commission has generally prohibited the introduction of non-agricultural supplemental uses where the agricultural economy could not be protected. A CDP in San Mateo County is highlighted, which involved a proposal to subdivide a single parcel into four lots and to construct two new single-family dwellings on one of those lots. In this case, the Commission denied the project because it was inconsistent with the Coastal Act, as the project would create a parcel where the only building site would be on prime agricultural land, and the sole existing agricultural well would be converted to serve residential development only. The document continues with some additional examples of non-agricultural uses that have been approved through CDPs, including one example of temporary wedding event facilities in Humboldt County that was found to be compatible with existing agricultural operations. This was due in part to this project not requiring the development of any non-agricultural buildings on prime soils, as the site would be used for the wedding event venue was part of the applicant's existing dwelling. Further, the site would, would not be actively used for agriculture, regardless of whether or not the site would be used to conduct weddings or other similar events. Therefore, the use of the site for wedding events would not displace existing agricultural uses or preclude its use for agriculture in the future. Having now provided a brief overview of this document, I'd like to wrap up with some final thoughts on supplemental uses. 
As mentioned earlier, the document is meant to be informational and not an authoritative guideline in determining what constitutes an allowable use on agricultural lands. Each supplemental use must be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis in the context of its surroundings and in the context of the Coastal Act and any other applicable legal standard of review, such as certified LCPs. However, local coastal cities and counties can streamline this process by explicitly accounting for supplemental uses through comprehensive LCP policies that both acknowledge and address agricultural and non-agricultural supplemental uses. When such policies have been included, many agricultural supplemental uses have been allowed when they have been proven to be necessary for maintaining agricultural viability. In general, these approvals were based on the supplemental use targeting the least productive land for the siting of the supplemental development and have required strong evidence that they truly are ancillary to the core farming operations. For non-agricultural supplemental uses, where the result could be the conversion of agricultural land to non-agricultural uses, the Commission has typically reviewed whether Coastal Act and LCP tests for conversion have been met, including whether continued or renewed agricultural use of the land is infeasible. Other criteria, such as whether the pro proposed non-agricultural supplemental use contributes to the establishment of stable boundaries and logical urban neighborhoods, and whether land unsuitable for agriculture has been developed prior to suitable agricultural land has also been instituted. <laughs> Lastly, cities and counties can go beyond land use policy to improve the overall viability of agriculture within their jurisdictions by instituting local initiatives that increase the value-added component of the agricultural products produced in their agricultural communities. Such actions that promote California's cottage food law and buy local initiatives, for example, can result in increased agricultural viability. And with that, I'll conclude my presentation on supplemental uses, and I will turn the mic over to Laurie Cotin. The third document available for public review is a fact sheet on the use of organic amendments on rangelands as a way to increase carbon storage. In this presentation, I will discuss the myriad benefits that may be obtained from the application of organic amendments to rangeland soils, including for soil productivity and climate change mitigation. First, organic amendments can include a range of materials and are generally derived from agricultural waste products such as manure, crop residues, or composted <coughs> vegetable scraps, such as those pictured here. To be clear, in this discussion, organic means derived from living organisms, not the manner in which produce was grown. The benefits we see associated with applying organic amendments to soils are the possibility for increased terrestrial storage of carbon in plants and soil, improvements in waste management by creating beneficial uses for common agricultural waste products, greater soil fertility and enhanced plant growth, the production of greater forage for livestock, and the potential for enhanced soil water capacity due to higher soil organic matter content. Higher soil organic matter content can lead to a higher soil water holding capacity, which prolongs the period over which moisture is available to plants potentially reducing the impacts of drought. When approaching the issues of carbon storage and carbon accounting, it's helpful to consider inputs and outputs of carbon to and from the land surface. Of greatest import is the net result of plant, soil, and atmospheric carbon exchange. Essentially, we want to know if these processes result in greater carbon storage in the terrestrial environment or greater release to the atmosphere. If the addition of organic amendments to rangeland soils results in greater terrestrial carbon storage, then this experimental measure aids in climate mitigation by sequestering carbon that would otherwise be in the atmosphere, where it behaves as a greenhouse gas and contributes to global climate change. On the carbon input side, the flux of carbon from the atmosphere to the terrestrial environment occurs through photosynthesis. The rate of photosynthesis is controlled by the amount of incident light, temperature, soil moisture, inherent plant and soil traits, and soil nutrients. Organic amendments can affect this process in part by adding nutrients to the soil. The amount of carbon leaving the system is determined by ecosystem respiration. This is the amount of carbon respired by plants and soil microbes. 
ecosystem respiration is affected by similar ecological drivers to those that affect the rate of photosynthesis. Therefore, it can be difficult to predict which process will be larger, photosynthesis or respiration, and therefore what the net result will be. Because the application of organic amendments has the potential to affect both rates of carbon inputs and outputs into and out of the ecosystem, their application could cause lower or higher plant growth in above or below ground tissue. Organic amendments could also cause ecosystem respiration to increase or decrease. Again, it's the net change of carbon inputs and outputs that tells us whether terrestrial and atmospheric carbon storage increase or decrease as a result of organic amendment application. <clears throat> One study conducted by University of California researchers Rebecca Riles and Wendy Silver examined the effect of organic amendments in two actively grazed rangeland sites, one in the Sarius foothills near the Central Valley and another at a coastal rangeland site in Marin County. This research, they paired large control plots where no organic amendments were added with experimental plots where organic amendments were added. In this research, they added organic amendments in the first year of the experiment and then tracked the movement of carbon into plant biomass and in the soil, and they measured ecosystem respiration of carbon from the land surface to the atmosphere for three years. What they found was a complex set of responses represented in these four graphs. At both rangeland sites, the addition of organic amendments was found to increase plant growth, soil carbon storage, and ecosystem respiration. So both carbon inputs and outputs were increased. However, the net effect as represented in the graph on the lower right was for greater carbon storage in the terrestrial environment, thus reducing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. At the valley site, this effect was large, with a net increase of 330 grams per meter squared per year of carbon averaged over three years. At the coastal site, this effect was smaller, but still positive, with an increase in carbon storage of 53 grams per meter squared per year. Results would be expected to vary across different rangelands based on climate, soil type, and plant species. Overall, average across the two sites, this research found an increase in terrestrial carbon storage of 0.8 metric tons per acre as a result of a single application of organic amendments to, to these two rangelands. Based on this finding, we can hypothetically examine what the effect would be if this experiment were applied on a larger scale. If we were to look at Marin County as a whole and make the following assumptions, we would see a potentially large benefit. For example, we know that Marin County is 828 square miles. If we assume that one third of this area is rangeland and organic amendments were applied to the whole county, then 137,000 additional metric tons of carbon would be stored in rangeland ecosystems countywide. This is equivalent to removing 107,225 cards from the roads for one year. These practices are consistent with many Coastal Act policies, and therefore the application of organic amendments may be something the Coastal Commission and local governments would want to promote for rangeland projects. Carbon storage and climate mitigation are consistent with po Coastal Act Policy 30253, which prescribes a reduction in energy consumption and in vehicle miles traveled. Similarly, these practices are consistent with Coastal Act Policy 30243, which states that the long-term productivity of soil should be protected. By adding organic amendments, which contains nutrients bound up with organic matter directly to rangelands, soil fertility is enhanced. In addition to these benefits, organic amendments may also enhance agricultural viability on marginal lands. As soils gain in organic matter content, they are able to hold more water. This excess water holding capacity can prolong the growing season, enhance plant growth, and thereby reduce the impacts of drought. This benefit is consistent with the goals of Coastal Act Policy 30241, which states that the maximum amount of prime agricultural land shall be maintained in agricultural production. Lastly, organic amendments are also consistent with Coastal Act Policy 30231, which promotes the maintenance of biological productivity in coastal waters, streams, 
wetlands, and estuaries. In this case, coastal waters are protected by the beneficial use of agricultural waste streams. Agricultural wastes are often concentrated on agricultural lands where they can easily spill over onto adjacent waterways. By applying organic amendments to rangelands, to range agricultural wastes become spread across the landscape and incorporated in into soils and plant tissues and are thus diverted from polluting waterways or taking up space in landfills. Overall, this is a practice with the potential to serve multiple coastal act policy goals that may also be a boon for farmers. It is also the subject of many active research investigations in California. And this concludes my presentation, and I turn it back to Madeline. Thank you, Lori. So I just wanted to um, briefly talk about our final document, um, which is a handout on ways to manage public access in agricultural areas to protect both public access and agricultural uses. In the past, the commission has heard from some property owners about the difficulties of allowing public access in or near agricultural areas. But overall, the commission has found that access can be effectively managed in a way that allows public access while avoiding impacts to agricultural operations. So staff wanted to provide a document that would describe some of these management strategies. Um, they include using trail routes that are well marked and well defined by landscaping or other features to discourage volunteer trails through fields or other agricultural areas, using fencing to delineate trails, posting educational signs, having dog restrictions or leash requirements where needed, and also seasonal trail restrictions or other limits on the availability of access may be appropriate when agricultural operations involve significant dust or spraying. And finally, where amenities are provided, such as benches, restrooms, and viewing areas, they can be located away from working agricultural areas. The document also discusses the possibility of using an advisory committee or other type of public forum for addressing ongoing management issues. This approach was successfully used by the city of Santa Cruz to manage the Arana Gulch Trail that extends through grazing operations that are used for habitat enhancement. And the document contains some um, links to related information from the city of Santa Cruz. And finally, the document references an existing brochure that explains legal protections for landowners if there are concerns raised about liability for risks of accident or injury to the public using dedicated trails. Although the title of this document is related to land trusts, I, I wanted to note that it also um, applies to landowners. So that completes our presentations on the draft documents. And we have a couple of minutes left for questions. Uh, if you, I don't believe we have any yet. If you have any questions, you can um, click on the red arrow in the top right corner and type them in. We'll, we'll wait maybe one more minute. Is there any questions? There's just a, a chat box in the bottom. If you sort of use the controls on your screen, there should be a chat box, and those will come straight to us. So we have a couple of questions about um, when the document will be finalized. Um, so we are accepting comments until June 23rd, and then um, we hope to have it finalized and out to the public later this summer. Um, there are questions about um, cannabis cultivation. That is unfortunately an issue that we didn't address through this project, um, but we are looking at it in um, several projects that are coming forward from local governments, and so commission staff is definitely working on that. Um, if you have questions, you can send them to our agriculture.ca.gov website, and we will um, try and channel those to the right staff members.
there's a question about the status of um, the NRCS consistency determination. I'm not sure exactly what that refers to. There have been a couple of examples of um, of consistency determinations that have been um, provided for NRCS in order to do agricultural pro projects. Um, some of those are in the document, um, but I, I'm not aware of one that's um, coming through right now. Uh, there's a question about, about the documents being available on our website. Yes, we hope to get those posted once they are um, finalized and out to the public. And we also had a question about deadlines for permit, permit processes. Um, generally, the permit process for the Coastal Commission um, follows the, the Permit Streamlining Act, which you might be familiar with. In some cases, there are alternative um, processing deadlines, and um, those are found in our regs. We can um, think about whether it might be possible to add those into the document on permit processing to, to help um, make that more clear. There is a question about um, an example of public works plan issued to RCD. Um, I know we've we've done um, a number of permit processing, kind of master permit processing for RCDs, and um, we can provide um, links to those. Um, if and and if there if that doesn't end up in the document, you can also send us an email at agriculture at, at coastal.ca.gov, and we can try, try and provide those to you. Some of those are actually local examples as well, but I think it would be um, uh, good to look at what's been done um, and maybe even expand on that uh, because it's been a, a really great solution uh, in a number of cases. Uh, there's a question about printing the presentation that was on the webinar. I know the webinar will be posted as a video, um, but I don't believe, um, and we could um, uh, post or distribute the PowerPoint as well. And yeah, and we, we received another um, request to distribute the PowerPoint so we can get that posted. So we received a couple of um, detailed questions um, about the documents, and we will be um, keeping the questions that were submitted here and using them, considering them, and using them as we um, revise the documents. You're also welcome to um, reiterate, if your question wasn't answered today, re reiterate your question or comment into um, e an email as well. Um, uh, we will do our best to um, address all of the questions and comments that we receive. So I think that pretty much wraps it up. Um, thank you so much to everyone for listening in today. We really appreciate your participation. 
really um, look forward to seeing questions and comments, and we hope that these documents will be um, useful to you and, and other um, stakeholders. Uh, please feel free to um, forward on this information to anyone that um, you know who might be interested. Okay, thanks so much everybody. Bye,